Discord button. All right, so welcome everyone. Also the people who are watching it on Moodle, um, perhaps on YouTube. I don't know if it's going to be on YouTube though. Um, we'll have to see what how it goes. For me, it's the first time talking about this project and it's um, not my project. So the data that I will be talking about today was given to me by Fritz and Fritz works for Professor Arlinghaus. Um, so it's a multi-year project and like I always said, like if you have a nice data set, just send it to me and I can make a lecture about it. So that's what we did. And I, I really, really like this data set. Um, there's a lot of interesting stuff in there, um, especially for teaching. Um, so yeah, the Bachersee project. Um, I called it fishy data, which is a little bit of a negative connotation. I don't mean it negatively. I just like fishies. Um, so, and I, I, I use my new pen that I have so I can make all kinds of drawings. Um, like I said, spend a lot of time on it. So we only have like 60 slides, 67 slides or something like that. Um, but I hope you guys like it. Um, in total, let me check. I produced, scroll, 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 245 lines of code. So, um, Fritz, uh, it's coming your way. Uh, I hope you like it. Um, I, I hope there, there's something that you can do with it. Um, but uh, there are also some points of concern on my side. Um, but we'll just go through it. Um, so today, Fishy Data, the Buggersay project. Um, many, many thanks for allowing me to work on the data set. Um, and I hope you guys enjoy the lecture. It won't be as smooth as the other lecture since this is the first time that I'm doing it, right? And the other lectures I've done already a couple of years in a row. So I'm hoping that you guys like it a lot. Um, this is going to be the new style. Um, so the, the kind of layout, right? You have to think of think out the fishy data and the other stuff. Um, but I'm thinking about keeping a style like this um, for next year or next semester, because I think we will still be in lockdown. So in-person lectures will probably still be hard. Um, so that's my kind of estimate for the coming semesters. Um, so I'm thinking about just keeping using this style. So. Big time bueno, thank you, thank you. Um, yeah, 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 and the drawing is really nice as well. So I'm, I'm really glad with the new toys that I bought. Um, so I hope that it works, works well and that you guys like it as well. All right, so I wanted to do kind of a story thing like 2000 years ago an ancient thing. So let's just start. One day I received one email and this email, when I got it, looked a little bit like a fishy email because it said, Denny, please find attached. And then it said fish and the word abundance. Um, and I was like, okay. But I saw that there were 17 attachments to the email, which is generally not common for a fishy phishing email. Um, although 17 attachments is a lot, um, they could be divided in one, PowerPoint presentation, um, which I quickly scrolled through and there were a lot of nice photos in there about people measuring fish. So I thought, all right, that's okay. And some graphs and stuff. Um, there were six R scripts in the, in, in, attached to the email. I have to confess, I did not really look at the R scripts at all because I'm going to do my own, right? That's how we roll. You give me data and I analyze the data. So um, six R scripts um, was okay. I have some comments on the coding style in the different R scripts, but we won't be going into detail about that. But um, Fritz, we, we do have to talk about the whole thing um, afterwards, I think. Um, but attached to, the f uh, to this one nice phishing email was also nine different CSV files. 
So I was happy about that. So the first thing that I did was just click download all and then extracted it and I put it in a folder. And that's of course the, the way that I generally do it, right? So if I receive an email and there's data, then I just put the data file somewhere. And of course, then I start looking at the structure because first I need to kind of understand what I got. And since I'm more or less a statistician, that's kind of how I've been trained. I kind of don't want to know too much about the data because the more you know, the more kind of researcher bias you bring into the thing. Um, so only when I have like very fundamental questions about a data set, will I start asking the people who gave me data, um, what does this mean or what do you mean by it? But generally, I just look at the data and have the data speak to me. So in this case, when I looked at the structure of the data file names, um, there were a little bit of a weird structure because there was three times a file which was called data with capital letters and then there was something there. So um, st stuff like Rotauge, zero, Rotfeder. Um, and of course, I'm not a native German speaker, but I Googled it and it turned out that those were fish names, or at least two of them were fish names. I, I don't know exactly what zero meant, but I just loaded in the files, right? Um, besides that, there were five times uh, a data, f uh, there were five different data files which were structured um, X, so something, then 20, then XX, which is a date, um, and then another X. So there was something behind it as well. So there were data files which were called young fish 2017 fish fang young fish 2018 um, young fish 2020 fish um, so there was some structure in the data um, but the first thing that i always do when i get data is open a new file add a header so fishyanalysis.r data by code by and catch them all right because that's the idea we want to catch all of the fish in the in the file. One thing that I found really funny was that there's an umweltdaten1.csv file, which makes me think that there's an umweltdaten2 or an umweltdaten.csv. Um, I'm just curious, but I looked at all of the things, right? So um, that's what I normally do. So um, the thing was, of course, hit add a new uh, or open a, f open a new file, add a header, and then the next thing is loading in the data files. Yeah, so loading in the data, we've done this hundreds of times or hundreds of times, but we've done this a couple of times during the different lectures. Um, so the first step after step zero is to load in the data. And of course, we first have to do a set working directory to where we stored all of our files. Um, and then we just do a read CSV on file name.csv and we store it in a variable. And then of course, from this variable, we look at the first five entries. I could have used the head function, but since it's a matrix, why not just use matrix coding, right? You can also use head. Um, but when I tried this, uh, it didn't work. If only things were so easy, because the data is actually not a comma separated file. I don't know why people like if you if you make a file, right? So that's always what I try to do. If you make a file and you name it docx, then I expect it to be a Word document. If it's a PPTX file, I expect it to be a PowerPoint presentation. And when people send me CSV files, I expect those things to be CSV files, but they were not. So of course, like, hey, I was hoping, read CSV, give the file name and then look at what's inside, but no. So I had to open them up in a text editor, manually go through them um, because most of the files use a dot comma as the separator. There were some files which used European coding for numbers and not computer readable coding, or at least the way that R expects numbers to be coded. So numbers were coded like one comma two instead of one dot two. Um, and funnily enough, I had to go through all of the files and figure out what people thought were missing values. So there's um, things which are like nothing. Um, there are columns where uh, NA is used, sometimes an X is used, and sometimes three question marks. I might have missed some of the NA values though, but um, th there's not, not 
very, there's very creative naming. So that was the first thing that I thought, like the naming of these files are really creative and that makes it really hard for a computer to understand it. Like after doing a little bit of analysis, I found that there were 41 different ways that they were using to write down 26 different fish species. And this is like something that I would like really want to stress. If something is a single thing, like a single fish or a single fish species, um, then write it the same all of the time because a computer can't easily figure this out. So you're going to have to write a lot of code or you have to going to write very smart code to kind of get around this issue of all of these different namings. Um, I even found a fish species which was called fish. Uh, I don't know what kind of a fish species is fish, but it's it's not a road auger or a or a road fader but no idea I, it might be that they just fished up something that they could not identify and just said well this is a fish um, there were some mysterious columns and one of them I actually mailed them about because I thought it might be very very interesting or not so much that it might be very impactful on the data analysis and there was this mysterious column called end dot dot u dot dot m um, and it contains the mix of values which are very strange so i found values like two dot dot five one comma five zero point five five um, but then there were also a lot of entries which were like second of june first of may uh, 18th of February and these kinds of things so I didn't really know what to do with this um, with this column so I mailed them and like based on the response that I got I, I kind of decided that well this is not the most important column and I have nine different files to work with so um, let's let's not get into it but one of the things that I want to stress if you want to have your computer analyze data for you make sure that you structure it and that you you keep to this structure and in this case the thing that i was missing the most was just a simple word document which explains what is in which file and what things mean right have a kind of metadata file which describes well we have these columns there's these values in there um and and this will come back and back because it it, it kind of trips you up on every step of the analysis um, and it forces you to write a lot of code which you probably should not have written um, if someone would just sit down and more or less harmonize the data across all of the data structures but again like this is normal data and like I've never uh, got a data set which did not use these kind of creative namings or um, wrong separators different number coding so it's very general so all of the data that you get kind of has their own limitations um, but yeah creative naming um, 41 ways of writing 26 different fish species so um, of course first I come up with some basic questions so the basic questions that I came up with is how many fish species are there um, are there, because have fish, they live in different lakes, um, are there differences between the different lakes, are there differences between the different similarities between the different lakes, um, and of course we want to do some modeling on the fish population, and one of the biggest thing in the data set which I kind of figured out is that there was this treatment column, so they also did some intervention studies, which is really, really interesting, but of course my first question is always, if I get a data set with with animals, I want to know where these animals live, right? That's 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 my first kind of question that I want to have an answer to because like, can I go there? Um, can I touch them, right? That's that's the first thing that um, if I get data from mice or cows or something, then where do they live and and can I go there? Can I can I see it? Um, so this is the first question that we will be answering during the first part of our lecture. Um, so like I told you guys, there's um, difficulties with the NA values. So the first thing that I did is um, 
do the set working directory right to move to where I downloaded the files um, I create a special variable called na which will contain the missing values that I encountered so every time that I encounter a new value which I think means missing data or not available data um, I, um, I I add it to the list um, so I started loading in so the first thing is the uh, environmental data called uh, uh, umweltdaten1 um, this is, has a dot comma as a separator um, the na strings I just give the na's that I have um, and this file turned to uh, use the uh, standard decimal separator so the the, the wrong one for R um, and fortunately after setting these parameters I could load in the data file and then hey, of course the, the data files that I saw there were young fish 2017 2018 and 2020 um, so I just read them in and these had the proper separator um, and I just loaded them in into three different variables called f2017, f2018 and f2020 for um, easy using them and of course since it's a presentation I always try to keep code short so that it fits on a slide um, so that was that was really nice um, and of course I always look at the first five uh, rows so let's just quickly hop into R and um, look at the rows together um, let me load the data and let you switch you guys to R um, so let's just load them in and look at the first five rows of all of them uh, let me make it a little bit bigger and just look like that right so this is the 2017 data and what we can see is is that we have an ID which I don't really know what to do I think this is just the row row number um, but that's what I got from it um, then we have a Gewasser name which my perfect German directly translated to lake um, then we have sampling point I think this is the different positions in the lake where they fished um, then they had fish art um, which is of course the species of the fish um, total länge um, that's the length of the fish um, but looking at the numbers as why I was directly confused in what kind of a measurement this was measured in um, is this centimeters or millimeters because a fish which is like a hundred and forty eight centimeters that's a big fish and hundred and sixty two is even a bigger fish that's that's huge um, so I was really wondering and and again um, yeah very big fish um, so the thing that I was wondering about like because they have these strange column names sometimes why not just add the kind of unit of measurement to the column right because in in the end when you produce data um, General Gulag says if you can catch a hecht which is 148 centimeters you're gonna be famous I wouldn't know that's the thing right like I'm just a poor statistician looking at this data and for me it makes perfect sense that it was 148 centimeters like I look Discovery Channel where they do this monster fish fishing right um, so 148 made total sense to me and I just assumed it was centimeters um, and then we have a bemerkung column um, and there's bemerkung on things like formal proba I don't know what that means so I kind of just ignored it um, but it's still in there um, and of course this is 2017 but then if we look at the data from 2018 um, we already see that they start being creative in their naming because now all of all of a sudden we have the name of the fish and then a space and then between the brackets we see that this is a cobitis taena um, or something like that um, and I don't know like is this important for the data analysis um, and uh, I would think that someone who works with fish knows the Latin name of the fish that they are working with um, but of course this creates a problem directly right I cannot compare the fish being caught in 2017 with the fish being caught in 2018 um, Their fish was stolz 143 centimeter long. <laughs> so apparently, 
apparently it is possible to catch a fish which is 143 centimeters um, but yeah. yeah but there's there's a discrepancy here so the, the 2017 data is coded in a different way than the 2018 data um, the total length um, seems to be very similar um, because values here are more or less similar to values in the uh, in the other one um, and then hey, when we when we go one lower, um, then we see that in 2020 they kind of used the 2018 way of writing down the fish names, but now all of a sudden there's a second commentatory column missing. So this is the first data that I got. So that's really nice. Um, so um, let's look at the Umwelt uh, Umweltdaten as well, um, because the Umweltdaten contain the stuff that um, we probably want to be interested in right because we are looking for covariates to our analysis so you can see it scrolling in front of the screen so there's a lot of data in here and um, just to give you an idea um, let's just first look at the column names um, so the column names are things like table gewasser gewasser id table gewasser gewasser name gewasser kurzel verein breitegrad längegrad all right, so now I was interested because now I can start looking to see where the fish are. So a umlaut is no problem for R. No, no, R doesn't care. You can use Chinese signs as well. You can even use these things for um, variable names. Um, th let me just as a little, little funny thing since I'm only having seven, 60 slides. Um, so let me think. Um, um, skull and bones. Uh, all right. Um, and I want to have the UTF thingy. All right. So let's see if we can do this. So in R, we can use this um, skull and bone symbol as a plotting symbol. So if I say plot 1 to 10, and then I say PCH is use this symbol, um, then it will kind of mess up. Um, but you can see that you can even, oh, let me make them a little bit bigger. Oh, um, and now you see that it does start messing up a little bit in the, uh, in the plotting thing. Let me see. Let me just delete everything afterwards. Uh, PCH is 10, and then do it like this. Um, CX. And then we need an is sign. So you see that it starts messing up in the in the in the terminal, right? Um, but you can you can use different plotting symbols as well. Um, so that's interesting. Now, now it starts messing up too much. So, but you can you can use any of these. And the nice thing is, if they're in a file, then you can just use them. Um, and for some things in mathematics, you can just name variables like pi. You could use pi for the variable name. So that's that's one of the things which is really nice about R. Um, but if we look at the uh, if we look at the Umwelt table, um, we see that there's a lot of things that they measured. Um, so abiotics, weather, there's commenta uh, commentatory in there. Um, there's like all kinds of concentrations in the water, like how much calcium or magnesium is in there. And here they actually did mention the units. Um, so I don't know why they didn't do that for the length of the fish, but it might be that the length of the fish is in millimeters and not in, in centimeters. Um, but there's a lot of things in there. But for me, the, the thing that I wanted to do was visit the fish and see where they lived, right? And then I need to have the Breitengrad and Längegrad, which is the, the like longitude and latitude. Um, so the first thing that um, we did, let me switch back to the presentation, um, is just read it in, right? And reading it in for me means showing me myself the first five lines and, and kind of getting familiar with the data, seeing what I can understand and, and what I can't. Um, so spent some time on that. It took me like half an hour to kind of get familiar with the data and where everything was. Um, so the first thing that I wanted to do was create some structure. Right? I, I, I told you guys that in every file that I have, fish names are coded differently. Um, and I quickly looked into one of the R files and I saw that they kind of uh, manually 
renamed the fish, which I thought was a little bit overkill because they wrote down all of the fish names, took like um, six lines of code, and then they try to harmonize it that way. But of course, we, we are using a computer and we're using R, so we want the computer to fix this for us. I'm, I'm not going to do anything. Like normally when people send me data, I am not going to touch it at all. The data file that I downloaded, generally on um, in our group goes on to the um, network address server so the big NES that we have and then it's being put into read-only mode so that no one can touch it and there is no chance that anyone will delete the file or that other stuff will go wrong right because raw data is raw data so raw data gets put somewhere and gets put into read-only mode so the first thing that I did is just take all of these fish art columns from the different um, different years that we had. So I took the ones from 2017, the ones from 2018 and 20, uh, 2020, and then I just say C, so I combine them all together. So I create one big factor with fish names, and then I say give me the unique names, right? Because I want to have the unique names. So there were some minor things. Um, so sometimes they'd use the set symbol, and sometimes they used SS um, as just the two letters S um, next to each other. So I use the gsub function, which is the global substitute function. And what this does, it takes a vector and it substitutes the S set symbol by the SS symbol, just to harmonize because sometimes the fish name was written with SS and sometimes which, uh, with S set. Um, then there were typos. So sometimes it was called lesion and sometimes it was called lesion. Um, and I just said, well, no, I want to have everything called lesion. I don't know if that's the correct fish name, um, but at least I needed to harmonize them because all of the other letters were uh, similar. Um, but in one case, they used an I and in the other case, they used IE. Um, so I made a little function for that. Um, so if I throw into this function a fish name, um, what it will do, it will replace all the um, S sets with SS symbols and then afterwards it will change all of the lesion by lesion um, and then that harmonized some of the fish names that I had. Of course then we were still left with this issue that we had um, the Latin name of the fish on the back. Right, so because we have the name of the fish um, and then we have space and then between brackets we have the Latin way of writing it. And that was done in 2018 and 2020, but not in 2017. Um, so for that, um, I, I did this um, call. So what I said was, um, well, first fix all the fishy names or f fix the names of the fish um, and then do a string split. Right, so just split the string into two parts um, by using the space. So when you encounter a space, just split it up. Um, and then, of course, because string split, when given multiple or a, a, a character vector with multiple elements, um, we have to it returns a list. And I only am interested in the first one, right? I want to have the fish name being Hecht or uh, Rotauge or Rotveder. And I'm not too interested in the Latin name. Like in the end, someone can back translate that for me. Um, so what I did is just say, well, so only take, so string split it by space and then use the select. So apply or L apply to the list that we get back the function, which is, uh, which is called select more or less, because that's the selection operator in R, and then comma one. So select the first one and then unlist it and take only the unique values. And then I looked at the length of the fishy names and now there were 26 different fish names. Um, let's switch to R so that you guys can see that as well. Um, so this is more or less what I did. Um, and this seemed to work really well. So F names. Um, so we have Hecht, Barsch, Rotauge, Ukelai, Al, Zander, Grun, uh, Gr Grundling, the Dreistachler, Hybrid, um, and and fortunately there was not um, like sometimes you see that um, they that, like the recheck. I don't think recheck is actually the name of a fish, but what would I know, right? It might be that there's a fish species called recheck, um, and then of course we also have fish, which is kind of general. Um, but that, so there's still some cleaning to do. So I'm still not really sure that there are 26 fish species. 
I actually think that there's 24. But I just assumed that there were 26 and continued with that because we, we still need to do some filtering. Um, so some of these typos will fall out when we start demanding that there are enough observations to do statistics. Um, so th that was the first thing that I spent like 25 minutes on writing the little function to fix the names um, and then afterwards um, doing the string split and getting the values out. All right, so after we did that, I wanted to know uh, how many lakes there were. And also there, um, there were some issues, but it was actually easier. Um, so since I wanted to keep it on a slide, I first defined which column I wanted to look at. So I want to take the Gewasser name column from 2017, 18 and 20. I combine them together. I take only the unique values and I store this in lakes. Um, and then I do something which is a little bit strange, but I will show you guys why I did this. Um, so the reason why I did this, so if we just look at the unique lakes, um, let me copy paste that in, right? So if we look at the unique lakes, then what we see is that there are normal lake names. Um, and then we see that there's something strange with the Donner Kiesgrube, um, because the Donner Kiesgrube has numbers behind it. Um, so the first 20 look like normal lake names, but here at position 7 you have the Donner Kiesgrube number 3. Um, so I, I wanted to get rid of those. So the, th the thing that I did is I say take only the first 20 and then throw away the seventh uh, observation that we have here. Um, so I did that and then of course I wanted to know how many lakes there were and of course we had 19 lakes and these are the names of the lakes that we then have um, so Kothamster Kolk, Lomore and, and Salsdorf and so that looked okay to me. Alright so now we've answered more or less our first question and so our first question is is how many different fish species are there? Well there are 26 or 24 I don't know exactly but I'm just assuming that there's 26 um, and then 19 lakes that we can can work with. Um, so then the next question was, of course, where do these fishies live? Um, so I took the Umwelt, uh, Umweltdaten and I looked for the Breite and Längegrad um, and had, of course, we can kind of draw a map and say, well, that's where the fishies live. Um, so the issue here is that the, um, the coding of Breitegrad und Längegrad um, was using the DMS format. So that's the, um, um, it's a format which means that you have the degree, then you have the minutes, and then you have the seconds, and then you have the milliseconds. Um, so it's, it's using the kind of way of writing down positions on the globe, um, which we used to do in like 1800s. Um, Google doesn't even understand it anymore. If you go to Google Maps and you input a location in DMS format, it will not understand that. Um, because Google and many other kind of navigation equipment, um, they use uh, decimal degrees, right? So we have to convert from one to the other. Um, fortunately, this conversion of going from one to the other is relatively easy um, because we can just say that the decimal degrees, which Google understands and I can fill in on Google map is equal to the degrees plus the minutes divided by 60 plus the seconds divided by 3600. Um, so that's the way that we convert from this DMS format into decimal degrees. Um, so let's do the conversion, right? So here you see the little kind of block of code that I had to write to do the conversion. Um, and this, of course, again, was because there were some issues with how some of these numbers were inputted. Um, so one of the things was that um, there was this single air quote being used, um, sometimes when they actually meant a dot. So the dot stands for um, seconds, while this other, this is the degree symbol. Um, and, and there were also issues with like additional spaces, so I had to G sub that out as well. Um, but this is the code that I used, um, and I, I wanted to just 
go through it um, yeah, because here we have this little function that does the conversion for us right so the, the conversion is dd is the degrees plus the minutes divided by 60 plus the seconds divided by 3600 um, and that that's what what's written here so we say as numeric x1 which is the degrees x2 is holding the minutes and then we have the seconds um, but uh, i just want to run through this whole statement with you guys and kind of show you guys how I come up with these things, right? So I, I look at the data and I can I can show you guys um, how I do that. So let me switch to R and show you guys the Umwelt um, Breitegrad. So Umwelt Breitegrad looks like this. Let's show just a, a couple, right? Like one to 10. So this is the coding that, that is being used. Um, so hey, it's like 53 degrees, 14 degrees, uh, 14 minutes, 20 seconds, 29 milliseconds north. Um, so that's the way that it was coded. Um, and there are some minor issues when you look at the whole thing, um, hey, because sometimes after the degree symbol, there's a space. Um, and sometimes there's also some other, hey, like here, you see that there's a space after the degree symbol. And of course the computer can't understand this like the computer really needs to be told how to modify the original input data that we have to go to uh, some data that it can actually understand um, so let's run through this whole big statement and fortunately it's the same for the latitude as the longitude um, so have we we first start yeah, but this is of course like how the hell do you come up with something like this um, to say well we do a g sub of a g sub of a g sub and then we string split and then we l apply then we l apply and then we unlist right so just to kind of um, show you guys how i how i build up such a statement uh, the way that i do it is first i look at the data that we have right and um, i do three times g sub and and in r like i know by now you should be kind of getting used to reading code and knowing that you read code from kind of the inside to the outside, right? Because the inside is what happens first and the outside is what happens last. Um, so that's why I'm also using this coding in, in colors, right? So these three G subs, they work at the same level. Um, so they are more or less applied at the same time to your data um, and after the G subs then the, it's a string split then we have an L apply and then an L apply which are more or less on the same level again and then we have the unlist which is kind of the top level function where um, which unlists everything into a single vector. Um, yeah, so we have here the, the date input format so we have 35 degree with a space 21 and then this thingy 56.64 and then we have this double thingy um, n. So three times g sub and g sub takes the from argument and the to argument so the first thing that I'm saying is take these um, um, symbols here and convert them to dots right so if I apply that to this then you see that the only thing that changes is that the first symbol uh, changes to a dot and I do this because that's easier to split because then I only have to split on the dot and the degree symbol otherwise I had to split on the dot the degree symbol and the um, the kind of single floating comma thingy um, then I fix the double space error or then I fix the space after the degree symbol and then the next thing is is to substitute out this north and east part which was in the in the text right and then I end up with something which looks like this like 53 21 56 64 and of course now the next step would be is to split this right because now when I want to split this I can split it in such a way that I can I can make individual um, numbers of it right because it's it's a big character thing um, so I want to chop it into four parts so the first part is the degrees then we have the minutes then we have the seconds and then we have the milliseconds um, so hey, I just use a string split for that so had the, the three G subs um, just go into the string split and then what do I split by well I want to split by the degree symbol and I want to split by the dot um, so that's what I'm doing. So I'm splitting by the degree symbol. I'm splitting by the dot. Um, and then I end up with a long list which has a lot of elements and each element will contain something which has a length of four. Well, not really because there were still some other errors in there which 
did not allow me to just say, well, the length has to be four always. Um, sometimes I ended up with a length of five. Um, so just to make sure that I always get the first three elements back, right? Because I'm only going to use the degree, the minute and the second and not anything else. Um, so what do I do then? Well, I L apply to the thing that we just had before. So to the list, which has four or five elements, um, I'm going to use the select function again. And then th this select function, what do I want to select? Well, I want to select the first, the second and the third element. So I'm just going to say one, two, three. And then of course, after I have these three elements, then what am I going to do? Well, I'm going to do an L apply again. So I'm going to go through the list, through each element of the list and say, well, now call my little conversion function, right? Which says do X1 divided by one, X2 divided by 60 and X3 by 3600. And then of course we can now unlist the whole thing and then now we have a numeric vector and this is something that we can use. Um, and so some code split in five by error, um, but we only need the first three. So I'm just looking at the first three and then ignoring all of the other ones. All right, so made a plot and I wanted to check, right? So I computed the, or plot the computed latitude and longitude and this looked pretty okay. So we see here all of the different lakes. Um, so I can show you in R how to do this, but I will make the code available as well. So, but when you see this, then every dot here um, should be a lake. So the first thing that I want to do is make sure that they are lakes because fish do not live in on land, right? So you can't fish on land. So I need to make, make sure that these positions that they wrote down, that they correspond to lakes. And if this is correct, then I have done the conversion correctly as well. So of course I did that. So I just checked out some coordinates. Um, so something which was called the slap through per se um, was located at this um, uh, digital degree thing. Um, so I just filled this in into Google and then we got here Godsmack in the Forelese, uh, which is a, a lake, right? So fish live in water. So I probably did the conversion correctly for this one. Um, I checked two more just to be sure. And uh, the all of the, things that I checked, they actually ended up on Google Maps being a lake somewhere. Um, so that was nice. So now we kind of know where they live. Um, and um, I have one of the things which was really nice that here it says Lomor. That's the description that they give me. Um, it actually, there's an Angesicht storm Lomor Gewasser. Um, so that made me think that, yeah, the conversion that we did is working and that's really true. Of course, we still don't really know where the fishies live, right? We can we can look at an individual coordinate and drive there and then take out some of the fish, but we want to do this in a more automated way. Um, so of course, we want to create an overview. So the first thing that I wanted to make is make a little matrix which has uh, the lakes in the rows. So have, like I told you guys, we have like 19 lakes. Um, and then for each lake, I want to have the longitude, I want to have the latitude, and I want to assign a color to each of the lakes so that I can distinguish between the different lakes visually on a map um, and that I could overlay this on things like Google Map. So creating an overview is, is more or less just filling a matrix. Um, so um, what I wanted to do is first create the lake and location table, right? So create lake and longitude and latitude. Um, so what I did is I took the, the column, which was called table Gewasser name. And then I, I, I just asked which rows are in the lake locations, right? Because I already defined the lakes variable before, right? When we took all of the unique lakes. Um, and then I said, well, um, there were some more lakes in the Umwelt tabella that were not in the um, fish table. I don't know exactly why, but um, it, it's just the way that it is. So first I have to figure out which of the lakes um, that I had actually, or which of the lakes in the Umwelt uh, CSV file are actually in the measured data. So the, the fish data from 2017. So I created the data frame. So I just say, well, I C bind the longitude, the latitude, and then I put the lake name last. And then I just say unique, right? Because if I call unique on a matrix, it will remove all of the duplicate rows. And of course there will be duplicate rows because the Umwelt data is 
data which has been measured over like a large period of time so the same lake is in there multiple times um, so by doing just the unique I now go from a matrix which has like a hundred rows to a matrix which has 19 rows which is the number of lakes that or the number of unique lakes um, I have to drop the third column or the, the third column right because I first I'm going to say use the third column as the row names and of course now I have a numeric matrix right because here I'm combining uh, so I'm, I'm C binding together a numeric value another numeric value and a character value but as we know in R, a matrix can only have one type. And because a matrix can only have one type, um, this matrix converts itself automatically into a character matrix. Um, but if we take the third column, use the third column as the row names, we end up with a matrix which looks like that. And now, of course, we can just drop the third column because the names are now in the row names and then we can just make it numeric um, by just saying apply to the matrix without the third column to the rows the as numeric function um, and then hey, we, we apply and then we do it a, a, a transpose because this this apply actually flips it around but that's not the biggest deal um, so then we have the lake locks and then hey, the lake locks is our matrix which now has two columns so just to be clear I'm also going to set the column names to know that the first column is the uh, longitude and the second column is the latitude um, hey, so um, and of course make sure that you comment every step of your code um, so uh, let's just show you guys how we how I got that far um, I can also show you the notepad window. Um, so here we have our massive statement looking at latitude and longitude, right? Then I do my plot. And then here I make the lakes lock mapping table for going from a certain lake name to the latitude and the longitude. And then um, just show you how this looks in R. So we can go to R, just reload all of the data quickly. Why not? Um, I'm getting some errors. Why is it not loading in the 2017? I, I don't care. But um, now when we look at the lake locks, right? So lake locks, um, then now the, the table looks like this. So we go, hey, so we filter down to the lakes in uh, which are which are in the, the measure data. Um, so we have 19 lakes and for each lake we have a latitude and a longitude. Um, and now what we can do is we can now add the color. So for the color, I use the Color Brewer library, which is one of my favorite libraries because they it just has very beautiful colors. Um, the biggest issue here is that a general color set, which is called a palais, so a brewer.pal, um, you can just specify it by name. So set three and set two are just sets of colors. Um, and we need 19 colors for 19 lakes, but the sets that I generally use, they only go up to like 12 or 14 colors per set. So I'm just combining two of them. So I'm taking 12 colors from set three, and then I'm taking seven colors from set two, and then I'm combining them together and calling this my palais. Right, so those are the, the 19 different colors that I'm going to use for the 19 different uh, lakes. Um, and of course, I can just C bind this to the column that I already had. Um, so hey, I'm just going to C bind to the lake locks, the different colors that I just selected. And now we have the matrix that we wanted to have. So we have all of the different lakes. Then we have the longitude, the latitude and a color. Um, so let's switch to R and do that. And just so that you guys know how it looks like. So I'm going to load the color brewer library. I am going to take my palais, right? So give me 19 different colors. And now we can see that when I C bind this palais to the lake locks that I already had, so to the matrix that we just created, what you can see is that we have Neumann's Kühle eh, located at this longitude, this latitude, and now we have a color assigned to it. And what you can see is that the matrix that we just transformed into a numeric matrix transformed back into a character matrix because we added a column which is a color and colors are character values according to R. So the whole matrix gets transformed into a, a character matrix again.
which we just have to keep in the back of our minds um, because head that's just something that when we plot it we have to make sure that we call an as numeric on the longitude and the latitude columns um, so that we can use it all right almost there right we can almost go to google maps and find our fishies or plot a route so that we can visit all of the different lakes that they fished um, so hey of course we we now need to create a nice new plot right so um, the thing here is the f lol variable um, so the f lol variable is a variable um, which takes the first name or the first letter of the lake right because these colors that we selected some of the colors are very similar um, so I also want to have when I plot um, the, the or make the plot right then I want to have the name of the lake not the whole name but just the first letter and then I want to have this letter into the color that I actually am interested in so what am I doing well I'm first defining the main which is the title of my plot um, saying where do the fishies live um, then I do f lol which is the substring of the row names of the lake lock from the first to the first letter so this just takes the first letter right it just takes the whole name of the lake and then takes the first letter and uh, puts it in there and then of course we set up the plot so the plot um, have we want to set some margins um, then we want to do the plot um, so the plot is just hey, because I looked at the numbers and the lowest number was like um, seven point something so I'm just saying on the x-axis um, go from 6.9 to 11.4 and so I just looked at the table um, and here we see that the, the, the smallest number is like 7.3 or something um, and I do the same thing for the y location right so the we first have the longitude so the longitude for the fish that they they caught was between like 6.9 and 11 and a half and then there was um, the latitude and the latitude range from like 52 to 53 um, I'm giving my own axis because I, I want to have some nice axis system there and I don't want R to do that for me so I say do not plot anything do not give me an X axis don't give me a Y axis don't put any labels on there just give it a title so it just makes an empty plot with only a title um, and then I'm taking the axis so I'm taking the first axis um, so this is the X axis and then saying well it goes from 6.9 to 11.4 um, step by 0 0.5 um, and give these numbers to it and the same thing for the Y axis just make your own X and Y axis because you have more control then I'm going to add the data points which is just points lake logs longitude lake logs latitude and of course I have to do an as numeric on this but it didn't fit on the slide so I'm leaving that out um, make them a little bit bigger and the point PCH right so the, the plotting symbol that you need to use is this F lol so the first letter of the lake um, and then give it a color um, and the color of course is the color of that we assign to it and then of course we need to add a legend because no one otherwise would know what the different colors mean and what the what the letters mean um, so we make our own legend I put it at the top right I say give the row names of lake locks um, make it a little bit smaller um, then use the um, use the F lol as the plotting symbol the colors you take from the color column of lake locks and then there are three um, columns so just not to have like one big um, list of but hemp make the legend and divide the legend in three different columns um, so when 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 we do this then um, we get a plot and this plot looks like this and of course I can I can just go to R and show you guys that this really works um, hey of course there's a little bit of uh, figgling around because we have to do the as numeric thing um, but hey, when I when I do the plot um, then now the plot looks like this and of course this already starts becoming um, a little bit better right because now we can see here we have the S which is in yellow so the yellow S is Salsdorf and then here we have the N which is in green which is the Neumanns Kühle so now I'm wondering right because we've we've now created this map um, but of course if we would want to use this map we want to overlay it on Google Maps to see how accurate we we were in in recreating the positions um, so that's what I did yeah, so low more and slept through per se I, I have no idea where these things are um, so I went to Google Maps and I just 
say to Google Maps, well, give me this region and give me that region. So you can you can fill in. Um, hey, so you can zoom in and zoom out, and Google Maps um, in the URL will tell you um, what the longitude and the latitude ranges are that you're looking at. Um, so when I do this, then it looks like this. Right, so I can just say, well, hey, this is the same plot as what we had before. I just remove the legend and just overplot it on Google Maps. Um, so hey, I just cut out Google Maps from online and then I put it in my plot so we can see that we can go from Lomar um, to Salsdorf to Schlepptroepersee to uh, Mormerland. So I figured out that this was in the north of Germany, kind of northwest of Germany, um, and that there were also some lakes which were relatively far away. Um, and you can see all of the other lakes are still here on the on the thing. It's a 28 by hour bike ride, yeah. Yeah, and that's just four of the lakes, right? So imagine how much time they spend driving from lake to lake, taking their rowing boat or whatever they use to fish up the fish. Um, if you want to walk it, it's like a... 600 hour walk I think but um, 28 hour bike ride let's go true um, so I was really really interested in that so now we know where the fishies live if we take a bike then we can visit four of the lakes and we can start touching the fish right because that that's what we actually want we want to touch the fishies all right time for a coffee break that actually worked out really well that worked out really well um, let me stop the recording currently.